We all know that you have been working with Arab since graduating from Dundee University in <laughs> 1971, leading big construction projects across Asia, USA, the Middle East, and uh, Central Africa. And we know as early as late 1970s, you have been to China, and ever since, you have been working closely with your colleagues to construct some of the most impressive you know, landmarks in China, such as the water cube and the bird nest of the Beijing Olympics. So could you tell us a bit more about your very exciting journey <laughs> and connection in China? Well, I started my journey to China uh, when I first went to Hong Kong back in uh, 1978. And um, I was very fortunate because I was invited to travel to mainland China, as it was then called, to help with some of the projects at the beginning of the opening up era. And the first project I worked on was the Jing'an Hilton Hotel in Shanghai, which was hugely exciting at the time, because as a, as a foreigner, it was very unusual to be given a, a visa um, to, for multiple entries and to give, be given free reign to, to move around the city and to talk to people. And although that was quite difficult at the time because not so many people spoke English, um, it was very, very exciting because you could feel the energy of China starting to wake up. So that project was very important to me. Um, it was, a, by comparison with some of the projects we were doing in Hong Kong at the time, it was relatively small. It was only a 45-storey tower. But in Shanghai, of course, everything else was only maximum six storeys high. So my tower totally dominated the Shanghai landscape. And we had to um, design, develop, uh, design codes of practice to design, to um, enable us to design these high-rise buildings in Shanghai because it's a very difficult place to build, build buildings, even now. Uh, although my building is still there, but it's now a, a small baby compared to the huge towers that are on Pudong and around. But it's still there and it's still a five-star hotel, so I'm, I'm very proud of it. But actually working with Chinese people um, who had had a hugely difficult time before the, the period of opening up um, was um, a life-changing experience for me because um, it was quite obvious that uh, the Chinese culture was so rich. It was coming through um, all of the discussions we were having about how you relate to people, um, their technical integrity, um, stretching ideas which for me as a relatively young man were quite normal, but um, talking to Chinese uh, academics and professionals who had not been enabled to, and allowed to practice these ideas you know, in the, the, before the opening up period. But that didn't mean that they hadn't been studying all of the um, technical publications from around the world. They were hugely well informed about um, best practice and, and technology. And so it was a very interesting time for me. Um, and it really one of the things that brought it home to me just how um, significant this project was, was when I, I saw the final drawings which had, were approved for the construction. And there must have been more than 140 different chops, all from different individuals who had to agree that this was uh, an appropriate thing to do. I thought, goodness me, you know, this is, uh, we really achieved something quite significant here. And of course, the bird nest and the water cube is such yeah. a sensation. Well, they, they were, uh, they, or they are sensations. Um, I, I can't claim personally to have been involved in those, but uh, my colleagues um, really, again, pushed the edge of technology. I mean, the water cube, in terms of its use of natural resources, water, heat, um, cooling is, was revolutionary. Um, the fact that it was using um, new building materials to construct the envelope of the building. And of course, the bird's nest is such a, a unique shape. Um, I think every capital city has something which embodies its energy and its, its personal, its characteristics, yes. 
and the, uh, the bird's nest for me is one of those buildings that captures the energy of Beijing. It's so strong, um, so, you know, so functional, um, so exciting really. Um, and it captured the whole ethos of the Olympic movement and uh, what that did to promote China to the world actually. You know, it's, uh, the Olympics were a fantastic event for China. You also is the chairman for the British Aviation Group. So I noticed last year you actually led a big delegation to visit China to try to, you know, build up much better links with the Civil Aviation Administration of China. So could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, I mean, the UK has had a very special relationship with the Chinese Civil Aviation Authority. And it goes back almost 20 years. Um, and um, it's enabled us to share our expertise, share our experience in the UK, which I think is, is, is world, well, it is world class. Every, every one of the top 60 airports around the world has got a large British involvement in it. In a sense, is, is what's happened in China. We've been visiting China for some 20 years, and a lot of British companies, some of them quite small, actually, have um, got very large projects in China. Um, I've, I was involved in the, um, in, in the Chongqing, first, the first phase of the development of the Chongqing airport, when um, Chongqing was, again, just starting to emerge as a, a major force in, in China, and the airport was actually the constraint on the growth of the economy, the local economy. There were so many things happening and there was just not enough room to get the number of passengers through the airport terminal. And now Chongqing is on its fourth phase of development. Um, and uh, you know, Beijing um, Terminal 3, uh, capital airport, was a major part of the Olympic initiative. I mean, it's, I think the great thing about airports is it's, um, it's the first place you see when you arrive and it's the place you see when you leave. So it's, it's hugely important that they are, um, they have a character of their own, but that they're efficient, that people find it a, a pleasant experience. People, nobody chooses to spend a lot of time at an airport, but if you have to be in one, then it should be as good as an experience as it could possibly be. And I think China has moved over the last 20 years amazingly. Um, you know, from the airports that I first visited back in, the 1970s and 80s to where we are now, where China is a world leader with Beijing Capital Airport, the second busiest airport in the world, going past um, Heathrow 18 months ago. Um, and you're seeing many other airports in China growing and, and acting as stimuli to their, their regional economies. Mm. Airports are not something that exist for their own, for their own sake they are actually engines of economic growth. And what we are seeing in China is a reflection of the strength of the Chinese economy in the growth of civil aviation. And it becomes a, a virtuous circle. Economy grows, airport grows, economy grows, and so on. So it's a very, very exciting time. Oh, definitely, because I remember uh, probably quite a few years ago, back to 2007, you actually wrote an article for Aviation International and at, at that time, you actually said, you know, China's airport infrastructure is struggling to meet the needs created by the country's rapid economic developments. But probably things have changed a lot, you know, over the past, you know, few years. So do you think at this moment, what are the big challenges and opportunities facing the China, you know, airport infrastructure? Well, I think that there is, um, is still room for growth. Um, in fact, if you visit any successful city, the airport is almost inevitably expanding. And one of the skills of designing airports is to design them in such a way that they can actually continue to grow while still serving the number of passengers that they have to, without it looking like a, a huge construction site. So um, Chinese airports will continue to grow. I think there's going to be a major capital investment, certainly over the next five years, before you're into the next phase of development where, it, where it's more of a maturing market. So it's evolution rather than revolution. Um, but at the moment we're seeing the new capital airport, the second airport in Beijing, 
because the first airport is now full. Um, so the second airport is, is now overdue and I, I believe construction will be starting next year on that. Um, there are new airports, brand new airports planned in, uh, one being built in Qingdao at the moment, um, the one I mentioned in Dalian earlier, uh, another one in Xiamen and, an, and another one coming in Chengdu. And, and that's on top of major expansions at a number of other existing airports. And all of that is driven by the strength of the, um, the Chinese economy. And it was, it was very interesting when um, the global economy crashed and um, passenger numbers globally dropped um, at almost every airport in the world. What happened in China was that the economy changed from an international focus to a domestic focus almost overnight and the passenger numbers didn't drop at all. They, they just tur turned from international passengers to domestic passengers and the growth just continued on the same path. So I'm hugely optimistic.